shelter, warmth, water, food. These in that order are what many survival sites will tell you are the things you need to get most when in a direct face off with nature. I cannot tell you how true that is as I never found myself in need of that advice. But I would like to call your attention to one thing. It's not water, no food, that is apparent most basic need, but shelter. And shelter, of course, can come in many forms. A cave, a dugout, a house, a palace, a skyscraper. Funny, but apparently, our most basic need is answered by architecture. And that field of study for every artistic kid who doesn't fancy seeing themselves as a McDonald's employee is our best link to millennia of human generations. Because architecture is not just grand cathedrals and white box houses, but also something we have to use daily and something that doesn't that easily disappear. And that gives us magnificent insight into the daily lives of people from hundreds of years ago. And today I would like to teach you a bit how to read that story. So first, uh, a few basic facts. I'll be talking about the around uh, 600 years of history when castles were being built from the year 900 to 1500 with a focus on more British and Western European styles of building. That is not a very particular place or time as I'm not trying, as I'm trying to give more of an overview than a specific historical lecture. I'm sorry for anybody who came for, for that. So castles have two basic uh, goals they want to achieve. They want to be a fortification, so defense against foes, and uh, a place for residents. The owner of the castle had to sleep somewhere and so had to his wife and kids. So, how do you read a castle? First, let's look at the general state we found our castles in. Let's look at its walls and shapes. Now we're trying to read the general life story of the castle. Was it built and left alone or remodeled? Are all the parts still there or are we missing a piece? To see how our um, castle first looked like, we have to look first for evidence of lost buildings. Some out of place rocks, supports for nothing. A good example of this is the Scarborough Castle, which has uh, a great evidence exactly in the stonework of its facade that what is now the entrance to the castle was once held within another four building. It's very rare that somebody would, look, uh, would build a wall to look like this. No, it's clear that the entrance was once held within another four building that no longer stands. It's very rare also for a castle to be inherited or gained in some other way and not remodeled. Technology and fashion changed, so castles had to change as well. And we can read those changes by looking for evidence of build new buildings built on top of older ones. This is the Helmsley Castle, or more specifically, the Western Tower. This will require a keen eye, but the stonework changes at the very top. This is as good evidence as any that the top and lower part were simply built at different times. And physics and logic would suggest that it will be the top part that is a bit younger. And indeed, when we look at the history of this castle, we uh, learn that it was originally built by Walter Espec sometime after 1120, but then was remodeled by his great-great-grandson, William Espec, in 1285, who added a whole, build, a whole story to the tower. And just from these couple of, of misplaced rocks, we are able to tell that this tower was built to be a bit shorter than it currently stands. So, a great storyteller of a castle story and uh, the story of the owner of the castle are the masonry techniques used, so the stonework. For example, this wall may look a bit boring to your used to brick modern eyes, but for Pitti, the original builder of this wall, it was a great way of showing off his wealth and power. This 10 meter stone was the talk of the town when it was first put in this wall because somebody has uh, paid a ridiculous amount of money to have it transported in full and not broken down. This was a very uh, expensive and quite pointless decision. So, uh, the basic way of building a wall in the medieval times was to build two nice looking walls and fill them with rubble. 
strong, quite steady, quite, uh, quite quick. Uh, but we can see variations of this foolproof technique and within them look for a certain chronology and how they appear. For example, in 1100s, a very fancy ashlar with rubble techniques started being used. It's very nicely visible in the lower parts of the downer castle. However, it was very expensive because this stone, uh, the skill in stonework required to make the stones as even as this was very high. And that is why the expensive of this technique is, is why uh, the cursed rubble technique was also very popular in the Middle Ages. It looks exactly as it sounds like, just rubble on top of each other with a bit of hopes and dreams. Um, it was very cheap as the material used to build a wall like this was usually found on site. And the technique required was also very basic and could be accomplished by most multicellular organisms larger than a chicken with a bit of determination. Not the most sophisticated of methods and not a very expensive one, but got the job done and wasn't very expensive. So, medieval castles use much more wood than we think. When we think of castles, we think of big stone buildings, but the truth is they used a fair good amount of wood. For example, if you uh, ever found yourself walking around a castle and notice a series of holes up high in the wall, there's a good chance that once upon a time, uh, wooden planks resided in those holes and were used as scaffolding, so for building. And that is a bit boring. So it's much more interesting once we get inside and we notice a series of sockets up high on a wall, because those can indicate that a timber floor once was in those holes like here, in this late medieval Scottish castle, Castle Campbell, its main hall was uh, in the golden age of this castle life story, had two floors. And we can still very clearly see the holes for the planks that once held the second floor. Okay. So now that you know how to read the general life story of a castle, I would like to teach you a bit to how date one. So, most self-respecting castles will have those two elements. They'll have a door or a window. If your castle doesn't have neither of those, I am very sorry to tell you, but that is just a pile of rubble and even I wouldn't call it a castle. So, um, and you can tell by the door or the window, the age of the castle, whether the rubble you found has been standing here since early, middle or late medieval period. First, tackling doors. Their shape in very oversimplified terms will go as follows. 11th to 12th century, 13th to 14th century and 15th to 16th century. So, the earliest doors will have a semicircular arc. It's named very descripti descriptive of its shape. It's a semicircle. Like this wonderful pair of doors up in Ireland in Ireland Church. Seeping, however, into the 12th century will be the Gothic style of architecture. And it will bring forth new forms and shapes into the world of building. The most prominent of them will be the two-centered arc. Which, will be, which we'll be able to see from late, late 12th century through 13th and 14th century up to as late as the 15th century. And again, a good indicator of the late 14th through 15th and 16th century will be a full center arc right here. We have to remember that these brackets are not foolproof and you'll find um, earlier, um, earlier arcs used in later doors. Um, and now, moving on to windows. Windows will follow the basic shapes of the doors as well. So, uh, the earliest windows, 11th to 12th century, will be small and set under a semicircular arc, as the Romanesque period was still ruling over Europe. And uh, then, in the 12th century and 13th century, we'll start to notice more uh, more dual-centered arcs. And in the 13th century, we'll have to look really hard to find a uh, 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 window set under a semicircular arc. 
Also, in the 12th and 13th century, we'll start to see a lot more embellished windows. The art of tracery here comes in to embellish those windows with beautiful geometrical um, embellishments. Uh, and we'll see multiple light or twin set windows set under a singular arc. And then, as the time progressed and we move on to the 14th and 15th century, we'll see even more embellished windows. Here, the art of Caliva tracery will start to take over, so more organic lines will take over the geometric um, patterns of the 13th century. And in the 14th century, um, windows like this will start to appear. This is perpendicular tracery, so multiple windows next to each other. Dating a castle is very tricky work, and sometimes the builders leave little traps for us using a style of arc that is terribly passé in their building. However, this is a good rule of thumb and a not too bad estimation uh, about your castle's age. So, from how to read the general life story of a castle to uh, how to more or less data castle. This was my small introduction into castle reading. I sincerely invite you to read not only castles, but other buildings as well as you pass to work and school, as architecture can tell us a lot about the history of the place we found ourselves in. And I sincerely hope that the next time you're walking around a pile of rubble, or as I would call it, a castle, there, it will hold more meaning to you than just a pile of rocks. Thank you very much.